I have another homesteading business video for you today where we are looking at selling meat legally from the homestead. It is crazy windy outside with lots of snow going on right now, so we are filming indoors today. I hope you guys don't mind. A few weeks back, in response to viewer questions, I did a video on different structuring options for your homestead business, such as an LLC, an escort, sole proprietorship, and I have some additional questions along the homesteading business theme that we're going to address today. I got questions from two different viewers regarding how do you sell meat legally from your homestead. How are you able to dry age lambs on your homestead, etc., etc. So we're going to dive into that today. First question is from Tim. Tim writes, I have four Katahdins, one of which I harvested up this past fall. If I were to sell the half whole and do like you did and take the carcass to a butcher, then what USDA rule did you have to follow? May I do that part myself and then take the carcass to a butcher if it is pre-sold? And then we also have a question from Daniel. Daniel writes, how are you able to dry age the lambs for two weeks in your barn and still sell to customers? I'm trying to avoid the butcher at all costs and our butcher will let the meat hang for five to seven days. I know the FDA has a lot of pointless rules about this, but I don't want any issues with them. First off, the governing body, the agency that's in charge of all this stuff is the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. Now is also a really good time to throw out our disclaimer. All right, here it is. If you are going to sell meat from livestock you raised on your homestead, you wanna sell some of that meat, technically the only legal way you can do that is if you put your animal on a livestock trailer and haul it to a USDA inspected processing facility. The livestock have to be harvested on site at the slaughter facility and then butchered there. Once the livestock go through the entirety of this process, that is the point at which you can sell their meat. It can be sold at a grocery, it can be sold at a farmer's market, it can be sold at a restaurant. This is what's also known as retail cuts. So you can take a pack of pork chops, lamb chops, roasts, you name it, package it up and sell it to any of these aforementioned markets. As a seller, there are some serious, serious advantages to going through the USDA inspection process. Because not only can you sell your meats as individual packages, you don't have to try and sell a whole animal at once. You're selling, again, pork chops, bacon, lamb chops, whatever it might be. You can get a real premium on your product. Selling retail maximizes what you can charge for your product versus selling wholesale. For example, selling lamb wholesale, you might be able to get six, seven dollars a pound for grass-fed organic. It may be more, it depends on your market. But if you compare that to what you can sell in a retail model, where you're selling individual cuts, you're looking at possibly 21, 22 dollars a pound for lamb chops. The price is gonna vary depending on what the cut is, but generally you're gonna be able to sell them for a lot more than you would at wholesale. And of course, since your meat can be sold in more venues, like a restaurant or a grocery, you have more selling opportunities. You have a larger market. The disadvantage is the processing costs are generally increased because you're paying for the USDA inspection. The facilities available that have a USDA inspector on staff are dwindling. A lot of these smaller processors are getting shut down all the time because they don't have the volume that the larger facilities have, so the USDA inspectors are only going to the typically more larger operations. There are fewer and fewer of these facilities each year, which makes it more difficult for the producers, the people growing livestock to be able to get their livestock harvested in this manner. What this means is that the farmers have to drive farther, much farther sometimes, four, six hours plus just to get their animals to one of these facilities as the amount of the facilities are dwindling. 
for a producer that's at the homestead or the farmstead scale where they're not a huge commercial farmer, maybe they're just running a dozen cattle or half a dozen pigs, whatever it might be, and you have to drive your animals four plus hours to facility, drive back home, then drive back there again in a few more days to pick up the frozen packaged meat. It can add a lot of cost to the farmer for fuel costs and their time, all the time in driving and transporting the animals, which is going to, of course, cause the cost of the meat to go up as well. So again, if you want to sell meat off your homestead, you technically need to go through this USDA inspection process. But Dan, you didn't go through the USDA inspection process and you still sold meat to customers. Not really. I technically did not sell any meat to customers. I sold live animals under a custom exemption or a custom butchery exemption. After selling the live animals, I made arrangements for butchery on behalf of the customer. According to the USDA, meat exempted from federal USDA inspection is custom meat or uninspected meat. Custom meat includes any part of a meat food animal, cattle, swine, sheep, or goat. Custom meat is not federally inspected at slaughter or during its processing. This meat is intended exclusively for use in the household of the owner only. So here's what you need to do as a participant in a custom meat transaction. As the seller, the sale is for the live animal only. Transfer of ownership of any portion of a custom slaughtered and or processed animal after slaughter is illegal. The sales transaction must be completed prior to slaughter. The buyers of custom meat fall under the same category as people raising meat for themselves, in that the custom meat is for the sole use of the owner in their household for their immediate family and non-paying guests. You may not sell, give away, or transfer ownership of uninspected meat in any way. There is a provision in the regulation that allows for multiple parties to buy one animal. So in general, cattle can be subdivided up to four times into quarters. Sheep and pigs can be sold in halves. The meat coming from the butcher also has to be labeled as not for sale, so it cannot be resold anywhere. The only people who can eat it are the people who bought it from the farmer before the animals harvest. So it cannot be sold at a farmer's market, it cannot be sold in a grocery or a restaurant. Of course, those are some disadvantages here to the farmer that they're having to sell wholesale to customers who want to buy bulk animals. They're not, be, they're not able to sell individual retail cuts. And their market is much smaller since they're not able to sell to restaurants or groceries. The big advantage comes from not having to use a USDA inspected facility. The personal advantage to me is also that I don't have to put my animals through a really rough experience the 12 hours leading up to their harvest. Hauling them off to a strange facility that is obviously going to be indoors in an environment with concrete and stainless steel everywhere. These animals have spent their entire life out on grass and then they go to this very strange setting where they're housed with all these other animals and it's just not a pleasant experience for them. It's scary for them, It's it causes a lot of stress for them, which also degrades the quality of the meat. Because it is best for the animal to be harvested on farm, that's the practice I have chosen to adopt. I want to give the animal the least stressful experience that I can give them. So you might be wondering now how you go about pricing and selling a live animal. 
Producers are marketing the animals, generally giving the option to sell by the half or the whole. They are giving pricing projections based on estimated animal weight, which generally comes from historical performance. So if every year a shepherd is generally getting a hanging weight of an animal at 50 or 60 pounds, then that is what they're projecting the final weights of the animal to be. So the buyer knows generally ahead of time about how much they're going to spend on the animal. The seller will generally take a deposit on the animal while it's still alive to show that a transaction for the purchase of the animal occurred prior to its death. The final cost of the animal is determined generally by the hanging weight after harvest. The hanging weight is the weight of the animal generally skinned, decapitated, and eviscerated. So it's essentially the hollowed out torso and the legs, which is the skeletal muscle of the animal. This is how Joel Salatin does wholesale meat sales and many other producers are out there doing it in this model. It, it satisfies the spirit of the regulation, but there's some question as to whether it really follows the letter of the regulation. Many have found that this way of doing things does satisfy the regulators and they're not any compliance issues. However, there are some other producers out there who are being a little bit more cautious and doing it a little bit differently. The other way to do this is to sell the animal completely before harvest and sell by live weight. It's a little bit more tricky to do because you have to have a livestock scale where you can get an animal on a scale to weigh it prior to harvest. Those selling by live weight are typically charging half of what they would if they're charging by hanging weight. Here's why. For ruminant animals such as cattle, bison, goat, sheep, their weight generally reduces by 50% going from live weight to hanging weight. 50% of the animal's weight is in their hide, head, and internal organs that all get removed during the harvesting process. For example, the shepherd that would be selling a lamb for $6 a pound wholesale at hanging weight would be selling lamb three dollars a pound live weight and that gives the customer the same price per pound of meat in the end. Daniel and Tim also wanted to know about harvesting on farm and dry aging meat on site. In 2016 we used a mobile butcher service to come to our property harvest our lambs on site. The butcher then brought the lamb carcasses back to his butcher shop and did all the cutting, wrapping, and freezing on behalf of our customers. And then I delivered the packaged and frozen meat to the customers. In 2017, I did things a little bit differently. I did the harvesting myself on site here, so I didn't outsource the harvesting to a mobile butcher. After harvest and evisceration, I brought the animal carcasses to a butcher shop where they did, again, the cutting, wrapping, and freezing. Once again, after the meat was frozen, I retrieved the meat from the butcher and delivered it to customers. The dry aging of the lamb carcasses I did here on site that Daniel saw in my barn, those were lambs for our personal consumption. I did not sell those lambs to anyone else. If you want to comply with regulations and be able to dry age meat, and do the butchery, any value add products such as bacon, sausage making, anything like that you want to do for your customers, the way to do that is to get your own custom exemption butchery license. The custom exemption program is a federal program ran by the USDA, so it is uniform throughout the states. However, your state, county, local governments may have some additional regulations with which you must comply. If you're interested in learning more about the custom exemption for butchery, head on over to grassfedhomestead.com. On there you'll find the blog post where I have embedded the USDA application as well as the rules and regulations that govern the program. So you can click on those and get a closer look. Daniel and Tim, I really hope that this thoroughly answers your questions and shed some light on this otherwise very complicated and confusing subject matter. And if you have additional questions in regards to custom meat exemptions, feel free to leave a comment down below. Or if you have questions regarding anything else, regarding homesteading businesses or husbandry, anything like that, feel free to send in the questions again through comments or emails. That's dan at grassfedhomestead.com or hit us up at Facebook, any of those avenues, and we'll see if we can get your questions answered in a video just like this.